Amen. So if you don't have a Bible, we have some Bibles on the table as you walk in. Please get one. Our gift to you, Merry Christmas. Uh, and if you brought your Bible, whether in digital form or in good old-fashioned paperback, uh, pull it out. We're going to be looking uh, at a lot of scripture this morning um, because we're going to look at the, the promise of how God wants to give you the gift of all things new. Uh, after 2020, who doesn't want a new beginning? <laughs> I mean, goodness. Uh, but we can't put our hope... Uh, let, let, how can I say this without being controversial and picking sides on anything? You can't put your hope uh, in anything but Jesus to make 2021 better, okay? Because the, there's only one who can make 2021 better, and that can't be legislated, that can't be voted in, and that can't be created in a lab somewhere. There's only one hope, and that is our hope in Jesus, and when we seek first Jesus and his kingdom, then all these other things will be added unto us. You know, otherwise we put our hope in the stock market or we put our hope in election results or we put our hope in how quickly our medical science community can get a handle on things. All those things come through the sovereign grace of God who can make something happen like that in an instant. And so let's keep our hope focused. We're gonna look at uh, our first scripture this morning is Luke chapter one. And we're going to read the message, the me we're going to listen to the message from heaven about Jesus' kingdom that he ushered in that first Christmas morning. And this is going to be very familiar to you, uh, Luke chapter 1. This is part of the classic Christmas story. And I wanted to start someone very familiar, somewhere very familiar to you. So Luke chapter 1, verses 30 to 33. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign... So reign, R-E-I-G-N, to reign is to rule. That's where we get the concept of a kingdom. I know for us Americans, we don't really have a concept of kingdom. So when I, you ever you hear me use the word kingdom, what I'm talking about is the reign or the rule of God. Does that make sense? The authority of God. Uh, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and here it is, and his kingdom, so the concept of reign or rule and kingdom are yoked, and his kingdom will have no end. Many of us miss the immensity of the promise of Christmas because we're focused on our traditional understanding of Christmas. We're focused on little baby Jesus, and we're focused on this cute little baby and that we get to give gifts to one another. But what we forget sometimes is that the greatest gift that God gave us through his son, Jesus Christ, is that the rule of God, the kingdom of God, would come, and to that kingdom there would be no end. Now, this actually, the angel here is referencing a 700-year-old prophecy, 700 years before Jesus. So Jesus was born around 4 or 5 B.C., I know it sounds weird that Jesus was born before zero, but, you know, that's just, you know, the, the clock, the calendar wasn't changed for hundreds of years later. Okay, so you can look all that up in your history class. Um, but 4 or 5 BC is around where Jesus is actually born. So about 700 years before that is when Isaiah gave this prophecy. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7. You don't have to turn there if you don't want. I know it's not a Bible drill. Uh, Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7 says this, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government, listen to this, this is a prophecy from the Old Testament, 700 years before Jesus, the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. And listen, very important phrase here. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. 
So who's going to accomplish the promise of God to bring in a forever kingdom where the rule of God or the authority of God will reign over all nations and over empires? God will do this. Man will not do this. God will do this. It's a promise. Okay, now Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Has anybody here ever heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Dietrich Bonhoeffer died in World War II. He stood up against Adolf Hitler. He was one of the very few German pastors who actually stood up against the regime of the Nazis. And he was martyred, which is a Christian way of saying executed, murdered for his faith. Listen to what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said about Christmas and about this baby Jesus as he was facing some of the darkest history we've ever had in contemporary culture. Okay, listen to Dietrich. The authority of this poor child will grow. You hear where his hope is? It will encompass all the earth, and knowingly or unknowingly, all human generations until the end of the ages will have to serve it. It will be an authority over the hearts of people, but thrones and great kingdoms will also grow strong or fall apart with this power. In other words, he was being very clear that we will see Nations and empires come and go. Okay? Here we continue with Dietrich's quote. The mysterious, invisible authority of the divine child over human hearts is more solidly grounded than, it's a comparison, than the visible and resplendent power of earthly rulers. So no matter how much you think this earthly ruler is going to fix things, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, facing Adolf Hitler, will tell you, you cannot put any, any hope in anything other than than Jesus. Okay, here we go. Keep with the quote. Ultimately, all authority on earth must serve only the authority of Jesus Christ over humankind. With the birth of Jesus, the great kingdom of peace has begun. Is is it not a miracle that where Jesus has really become Lord, and there's a lot in that sentence there, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is famous for writing a book called The Cost of Discipleship, and he, he, he really goes aggressively after Christians who have what he calls cheap grace, where they're not really following Jesus. So we're talking about a very strong Christian man here. So he's saying a lot in that little statement. He says, Is it not a miracle that where Jesus has really become Lord over people, peace reigns, rules? That there is one Christendom on the whole earth in which there is peace in the midst of the world. Only where Jesus is not allowed to reign, rule, where human stubbornness, human defiance, human hate, and human avarice. Avarice is an old word which means covetousness or an extreme amount of greed. Okay? Only when those things are allowed to live on unbroken can there be no peace. Jesus does not want to set up his kingdom of peace by force. And that's what makes Jesus different than man. Okay? Jesus does not want to set up his kingdom of peace by force, but where people willingly submit themselves to him and let him rule over them, he will give them his wonderful peace. And the reason I wanted to share that lengthy quote with you is because sometimes we can look at the promises of God, especially for his eternal kingdom, for his new beginnings, we can look at them as pie in the sky, whitewashed promises that don't have anything to do with real life today. And here was a man who faced darkness and spoke of how the light brings hope and how the light brings peace. And though he did not see the end of World War II, he was executed before, actually weeks before Hitler committed suicide. The reality is he knew that the kingdom was greater than anything that man could bring. So what was Bonhoeffer's hope in the midst of Hitler's regime? It was the poor, lowly Christ child, the manger. Because he knew that in that child there was a new beginning, a new kingdom, and one that would have no end. And Paul said, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 2, that it's at the name of Jesus that every knee shall bow in the heavens, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that he is the Lord. That is a promise. And we were talking in Sunday school class that promises are facts, they are truth, 
And the reality, as we'll see by the end of this sermon, by the end of this teaching on new beginnings, is that your knee will bow because he is Lord. And he wants you to choose him. He wants you to surrender to him. Through Christmas, God promises to make all things new. That's the promise of Christmas. And maybe like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we're living in dark days and we're not seeing the promise fulfilled. But like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we need to hang on to the hope that God is doing something. And God is bringing his kingdom of peace even when there's war, even when there's disease, even when there's famine. Now, the thing about the kingdom of peace is that's diametrically opposed to the kingdoms of this world. It's diametrically opposed to our stubbornness, <laughs> our defiance, our hate, our greed, our discontentment. This new thing that God promises requires each of us to choose for ourselves if we want the kingdom of the Christ child to be birthed within us. On this day, a child is born. And Isaiah said that this child born to us, this son given to us, the government will rule upon his shoulders. And so when you feel the weight of the world upon your shoulders and you are feeling weary and heavy burden by all the governmental responsibilities of your life, are you going to allow all those circumstances to crush you? Or are you going to turn to the one who promises to give you peace? Will you choose to find rest in the only one who can give you rest. And that's one of the greatest promises of Christmas. And this promise does require us to choose him, to come to him, to put our faith in him. But what a great transaction it is. I want you to hear the transaction of faith. Go to 2 Corinthians that's one of Paul's letters in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 21. And I want you to hear some of the greatest promises of the transaction that happens, the transformation that happens through the Christmas miracle of receiving the gift of Jesus Christ. You know, I can give you a gift, pretty packaged, pretty, you know, big bow, but if you don't open the gift, then it's no gift at all. God is offering you a gift this morning. It, it, it is so well prepared, so beautifully packaged for you. But the glory of the gift is not in how pretty it looks from the outside. The beauty of this great gift, this indescribable gift that Christmas offers you is what happens when you open it, when you receive Christ. And so Paul said this, for the love of Christ controls us. Wow, did you hear that? Immediately, the first words of Paul are about the government of Jesus, the government of his love, the reign of God, the rule of God. For the love of God controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, talking about Jesus, therefore all died, and he died for all, so that they who might live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. I'm so glad we had a baptism today because in baptism you see the imagery that Paul's talking about here. When you partake in the death of Jesus, you are then entitled to, by his grace, to partake of his resurrection. You must die with him so that you can live with him. The rule of Christ compels you. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him in this way no longer. Now, here's the beautiful promise. Hear this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. When you come into a relationship with Jesus, he says, the old is gone. It's under the water. It's dead. The old man is gone. You have been made new. You have been lifted up into the heavenlies. And then Paul adds these words. Verse 18. 
Now all these things are from God who reconciled us. Big word, reconcile means to make right, to have a right relationship. To reconcile with someone is to get back in right relationship with them. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, which is a word for sins, not counting their sins against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. And remember, ambassadors don't represent themselves. Okay, if you are a United States ambassador to pick a country, you don't represent yourself, you represent the present, you represent the interest of the nation. Okay, Jesus is saying we are ambassadors of his kingdom of his rule over the world. You are now an ambassador of reconciliation. Another word could be peace, bringing peace to people between God and people and between people, okay? So let's finish up this scripture. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. God is using our lives to bring peace to other lives. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be right with God, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin talking about Jesus here. Jesus took on flesh and became one of us. He knew no sin, but he became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Righteousness just means right standing, having a right relationship with God. And so this morning, as we prepare to enter into the new year of 2021, I invite you to be reconciled to God. I invite you to have peace between you and God, to receive the gift of new beginnings, to receive the rule, the kingdom of God that has no end in your life, that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you, you enter eternal life, you enter into his rule, into his kingdom, and there is no end, and there is peace between you and God, and then there is the opportunity for peace between you and other people. There's forgiveness and grace at the throne of God. There's forgiveness and grace at the foot of Jesus, whether it's at the manger or at the cross. Jesus offers you this gift today, and he invites you to open this gift so that you may find hope for 2021 in him, so you may find the strength of the Lord through joy in him, so you may find love, a love that drives out all fear in him, this is the grace of God extended to you. This is the offer for new beginnings. Seize the moment. Today is the day of writing a new chapter. But let the, let the zeal of the Lord complete this and you just submit to him today. Surrender to the one who will give you peace. Jesus said in John 3.3, 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Because the invitation to the kingdom is to convert you into a new creation. It's not to carry a little bit of the old life with you into new life. It's not to take the old ambitions and Christian them into his ambitions. He is saying that when he brings you to Christ, he'll make you a new creation. You must be born again. conversion. I know that word has a lot of religious connotation, but just think, what does it mean to convert something? It means to change it, like if you're converting over to a new operating system on your computer, do you keep the old operating system and then put the new operating system on top of it? I don't think so. I'm not a computer tech, but does that make sense to you? Don't they take, doesn't the old one have to go off and the new one come on? Conversion is being transformed through faith and, rep and repentance into something different than you were, born into something new, something other than you were. And I think that's one of the things that muddies the water of the church is we see Christianity as a get help plan or as a make my life easier plan, or to get out of jail free card plan, or someday out there fire insurance plan. But we're talking about new life today. New operating system today. 
new way of thinking today. New beginnings in a kingdom that never ends. Not putting our hope or our peace or our joy in anything that will end. Because that's the way of the old operating system. And so when we struggle with peace or anxiety or fear, maybe it's because we're still letting some of the old operating system ways of thinking come in. And when those people or organizations or institutions or governments fail us, we go down this crash and we lose hope. We start to despair. When Jesus says, let my peace guard your hearts and minds because my kingdom has no end. Let my spirit fill you. Don't get drunk on wine. That leads to dissipation. That leads to anger and strife and envy and quarrels. quarrels. No, be drunk on the spirit and be filled with this new way of thinking. Listen to Titus. This is Paul actually speaking to his disciple Titus. And he captures this so beautifully. Listen to this. We're talking about conversion. What does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to have a new operating system? He nails this. Titus 3, verses 3 to 7. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another, that's the ways that, that's just the, the water we drink in our culture in this life. But, but when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. This is the meaning of Christmas. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds, in other words, not by works, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to what? His mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Regeneration. Sounds like a Star Trek term. Making you new. Converting you. I know converting, you might have that all caught up with childhood imageries of religious stuff, but he's making all things new. That's the language of born again. That's the language of salvation. That's the language, again, of regeneration. It's what it's all about. He's making all things new. He's restoring you, making you right, righteousness, reconciliation with the Father so you can be a part of his family again, so you can be a part of the family that is bringing peace, the kingdom of peace, to all these people in rebellion and darkness that we once were a part of. We're no better than we're simply now made new, not by our own works, but by what Christ's mercy has done for us. And then the scripture ends, when he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified, made right, by his grace, we would be made heirs. Heirs. For those of you who have buried parents, you know what an heir is. An heir is someone who has right of inheritance. You have right of inheritance. Parents when, and grandparents, when you set up an estate, you have heirs, people who are going to receive that which you pass on to them. God has this, these promises that are our birthright. We are heirs, according to the word of God, according to the hope of eternal life. This is the good news of the gospel. This is why Jesus came. This is the miracle of Christmas when it's yoked with Easter. And when we understand Christmas in the light of Easter and Easter in the light of Christmas, they may be four or five months apart, but the reality is they're celebrating the one kingdom of the one God that he has established for us to be made right and to have new life, a life that will never end. Being born again is just the beginning of this new life. Your conversion, the moment you accept Jesus, that's just the beginning. That's not the end. It's just the beginning. It's just the beginning of a kingdom that will never end. Jesus Christ is the doorway to all the promises and blessings of God. When you enter into the doorway of Jesus by putting your faith in him, you are entering into a kingdom filled with promises and blessings. Jesus Christ is the one way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but through him. John 14, 6. 
And then we see in uh, Mark 1.15, the time is, this is the words of Jesus, his earliest preaching, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus himself is calling people to enter into this kingdom through his gospel. And you might ask the question, what does he mean the time is fulfilled? Well, Paul answers that for us. And we did a whole sermon on this. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 7. The fulfillment of God's promises. Listen, Paul said, but when the fullness of time came, this is Galatians 4, 4 through 7, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Merry Christmas. This is the Christmas story. So that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Why sons? Ladies, this is not to keep you out. It's because in this time when the Bible is written, sons had a right of inheritance. They were the heirs. And so you have been given sonship by God, which has nothing to do with gender, has everything to do with rights of inheritance. God has given you, through his son Jesus Christ, the right to be an heir of all the promises of God when you submit your life to the rule of God, when you enter into the kingdom that has no end, because it's a kingdom of peace. Because he's taken the strife, he's taken the sin onto himself, and he's given you peace, righteousness. And that's why Paul can say this, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. Because before Jesus came and before Jesus died on the cross, God could not enter into you to fulfill the promises of the new covenant because his spirit could not dwell where there was, where there was strife, where there was, where there was sin. And so when Jesus came and became the perfect Passover lamb and he died on that cross for the forgiveness of your sins, what he does is he removes the sin from your life so that now his spirit can enter into you. And when God's spirit enters into you at the time of your conversion, at the time of your faith, then he has given you eternal life. And that's why Paul can say this, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. We can now call God Daddy because we have been adopted into a new kind of relationship with God where we no longer stand in fear of him. Yes, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom because you have to know that you're separated from God, that you're under judgment and wrath because of your sin. But because now with Jesus coming and you receive his spirit and you cry out, Abba, Father, it's because you've been given a new relationship. You're no longer scared of God because you stand under his judgment. You now receive him as one who has right of promise, right of blessing, because he's removed the judgment from you and he's put his son's blood on you. Oh, this is your salvation. This is the Christmas miracle. This is why Christ came. And Paul finishes, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. There's that concept again. It's throughout the scriptures right of inheritance. Jesus knew this when he came. Jesus came to us from heaven on that first Christmas to usher in the fullness of time when the old covenant between God and humanity would be fulfilled through his life and through his death and through his resurrection so that he could institute not just the Lord's table where we take communion, but he could institute the new covenant, which is what we commemorate or celebrate every time we take communion, which will be next week. So when you come back next week and we're approaching the end of Christmas and approaching Epiphany, I am gonna lead us in partaking in the Lord's Supper together. And we need to remember that it's why Christ came. It's not just why he died. It's why he came in the first place. No one took Jesus' life from him. He gave his life. His very coming from heaven to earth was a sacrifice, but he did it in such a way that it was no sacrifice to him because he loves us. You ever notice that before? Someone says, well, thanks for this sacrificial gift. And they're like, no sacrifice at all. I love you. Here you go. 
Maybe you experienced that a little bit over Christmas. Maybe you, someone experienced that through you. I want you to hear, I know we're pressing time a little bit here, but I want you to hear the old covenant promise because sometimes we just so flippantly say, Jesus fulfilled the old covenant. I just want you to hear, and I'm just going to do one of them. There's like five or six verses. Ezekiel, really kicking it old school here. Old Testament, Ezekiel, 36 verses 26 to 7. About 600 years before Jesus, God says this to the prophet Ezekiel. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. This is Ezekiel, okay? The last thing you probably think about when I talk about Ezekiel is the new covenant. Okay, but Ezekiel was one of the prophets hundreds of years before Jesus that God spoke through to tell us that he was going to do something new. Ezekiel said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. It is done. This has been done. This is what Jesus came for. It's done. That's why upon the cross, Jesus could say, it is finished. And what do we do? We commemorate. We remember. We celebrate. We walk in. We live. We proclaim. We testify. Our whole lives are a celebration of this reality. We are now living in the new covenant because of what Jesus Christ did for us. And that's why Jesus could say in John 10, and you're going to know part of this verse. Trust me, you'll know it. In John 10, verses 9 to 10, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is the door. He's the way into the new pasture. Not pastor, but if we're sheep, a pasture. The lands where the sheep would graze and eat and have their fill and live in abundance and be cared for. Jesus is the good shepherd of your soul. And Jesus has given you this gift through faith. And this has been the preaching of the church from the beginning. This is nothing new. In the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 18 to 21, here is one of the earliest recorded sermons of the church. Acts 3, verses 18 to 21 says this, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, we just quoted Ezekiel, we've quoted Isaiah, I could quote Jeremiah, that his Christ would suffer. He has thus fulfilled, God has fulfilled these things. Therefore, Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until... Pay attention, because we're about to... Wrap, we're going to wrap this whole thing up, but you got to see the transition here. Okay, in this earliest sermon of the church, you heard... The preacher talk about how all the prophets were fulfilled. Now listen to him at the end of this. He says, He may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all. The period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. And so we're going to ask one last question. What is this period of restoration of all things? Because Christmas gives us the promise of new beginnings. Christmas gives us the promise of a kingdom that has no end. But it can't be this. 
It can't just be this life. It can't be what Dietrich Bonhoeffer went through under the hands of Hitler. It can't be all that we're going through, through COVID and through political unrest and civil unrest. There's got to be more. There's got to be something more. The earliest preachers to me today give you this hope. And that hope is the fulfillment of what Jesus ushered in on that very first Christmas 2,025 years ago. It's the rule of God, the kingdom of God, the reign of God on the earth itself, which the Bible calls the new heaven and the new earth. This is our hope. This is our message that he himself is going to come and make all things new, make all things right. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. If your hope is only in these 90 years, 70 years, 50 years, whatever the Lord's given you, if that is where your hope is, you are to be pitied above all people. Christ has given us so much more than this life and this time. He's given us the hope for eternal life. It is God on his throne in heaven. It is Jesus speaking from the throne in heaven who has given us these magnificent and precious promises of his fulfilled kingdom in Revelation 21, 3 through 8. Here it is. This is the, this is the culmination. The big fancy word is the consummation. It's the completion of all things. And Jesus said in the revelation of John, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God, the temple of God, the dwelling place of God is among men. That's not, don't be, it's not about gender there, it's among humanity. The tabernacle of God is among humanity. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is a promise. And there will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain because the first things have passed away. Oh, there's something better coming. Hang on. Have hope. Have faith. Persevere. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. That's the promise. And Jesus said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. When did you hear Jesus say it was done the last time? On the cross. Jesus said it is done on the cross. And where do you hear him say it is done again? In the vision of that which is to come. It is done. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he'll be my son. Remember, sonship is about inheritance. You're an heir of God. You're no longer a slave of fear. You are a child of God. Don't live in fear. Don't live without hope. Don't live in despair. He has freed you from that. But for the cowardly, and this is, I'm finishing Jesus' words here. Felt like the Lord wanted me to read the whole passage. We usually cut it off there because we're we're happy, clappy American Christians. We don't like to talk about the hard stuff. But here it is. Here's the full gospel for you. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. These are the promises of God. This is the rule of God's kingdom. And he wants to give you peace. And all you've got to do is bow the knee to him and submit to him and say, thank you, Jesus. I receive what you have given to me. What you have given to the world. Never forget what the angel spoke to Mary that first Christmas morning. Because we're back to the Christmas story. And that's where we're ending. 
The angel said, his kingdom will have no end, Mary. And in this kingdom, Jesus, the baby that was in Mary's womb, says this, behold, I am making all things new. That's what this kingdom is about. This kingdom is about making all things new. And this begins in you at your conversion. But it's not completed until his consummation, until he brings it to fulfillment. He is the one who will bring your faith to the finish line. He is the one who caused you to overcome. He will persevere in you because the Bible says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So fret not, fear not, do not be afraid. Jesus invites you to be a part of him and his kingdom. And he's taught us to pray these words. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. May it be done in us. May it be done through us. Now and forevermore in and through 2021 until the day of Christ Jesus when he perfects that which he began. Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Amen. If you have not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please come talk to me. Don't start 2021 on your own. If you need to rededicate your life to the Lord, please come forward and talk to me. If, you, if you're kind of embarrassed about coming down and talking to the pastor, then talk to someone in your family. Talk to someone who's sitting near you. We want you to start 2021 with your hope and with your faith, and with your joy, and with your love, firmly in Christ, and in no one else. So allow me to pray for you, and so you can go from this place, and enter the new year with new beginnings, beginnings that will never end. Lord Jesus, I thank you for each person in this place. I thank you for the promises of God that are so rich. Uh, Lord Jesus, would you, be, would you be the Lord of each person within the sound of my voice? Would you be the Lord of each person in this room? Lord, your word says that you are Lord and that every tongue will confess, that every knee will bow. So Lord, would each person now feel the compulsion of the Holy Spirit? May the love of God compel them to submit themselves to you, whether for the first time or in a rededication. And if anyone, Lord, needs to follow you into the waters of baptism or needs to make a decision, Lord, may your Holy Spirit press upon them to choose holiness and righteousness, to choose peace. Forgive everyone within the sound of my voice of their sins as they come to you, Lord, and ask you through the blood of the atonement to forgive them of sins. Make them new through the shedding of your blood, poured upon them abundantly. Bless your children, Lord. These are your sons and daughters. Bless them and send them forth with this blessing so that they may bring peace to their neighbors, peace to their coworkers, peace to their classmates. Go from this place. I give you God's peace. Find rest for your soul in Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas and have a happy new year.